Greetings. Uh, my name is Daniel Kraft, and we're going to spend the next about 90 minutes um, at Our Future Health exploring the future of technology and where, where can healthcare take us as we move into this bright new world. Um, a little bit about me. I'm a physician, scientist. Uh, I chair the medicine side of Singularity University and also uh, chair and curate a program called Exponential Medicine, where we look at how can we take technology and use that to reinvent the future of health and medicine across the spectrum. So we're gonna spend, again, this, uh, this hour or so on our Future Health live stream, looking at a slew of technologies and how they're blending with unmet needs and technology and incentives to reshape healthcare uh, across the planet. Um, and because there's so much happening, I'm gonna try and divide the talk into about five different areas. Um, a bit about how we can use technology in smarter ways for our own personal health, uh, wellness, and prevention. Um, how, can, how technology is reshaping diagnosis, enabling us to pick up disease earlier and more proactively at earlier stages. A bit about the future of therapy, the cutting edge of personalized medicine, precision medicine, everything from drugs, devices, to gene therapy. Global health, how we can democratize healthcare around the planet, bringing us smarter, cheaper, and more accessible uh, health, wellness, and therapies. And I'll close with a bit about discovery. How do we think differently about clinical trials and all being participants in the future of health and medicine? But before we sort of go you know, into the future, it's sometimes fun to go Back to the Future. Many of you uh, know this movie, Back to the Future. Uh, we're already actually past the date in the past where they went to in the future, if you can follow that. So, uh, and it's always interesting to look back at the past and think, what did the future look like to those living in the past? Um, I'm here speaking to you from Silicon Valley in California. And here we have a healthcare system, uh, a big one called Kaiser Permanente, started in the 1950s. And when Kaiser was starting, they made this little, little movie about what they thought the future of the hospital was gonna look like. So take a look and see if you can recognize what's the same and what's changed in the last uh, 60 years or so. A medical dream comes true under the trial of industrialist Henry Kaiser, who holds the plans of the ultra-modern hospital designed by Dr. Sidney Garfield, director of the Kaiser Foundation. From the admissions office on, everything is streamlined and expedited. The patient's record reaches the doctor before he does. This is the last word in the combination X-ray machine and fluoroscope imported from Holland at a cost of $25,000. Every portion of the body through 180 degrees can be photographed. In the operating room, the first light of its kind is installed. No portion of an operation is ever in shadow, nor is the expectant father forgotten. Here he can get the news officially and suffer under the most comfortable circumstances possible. And for mother, well, she has only to call for her baby, and baby comes sliding through a wall in a drawer-like bassinet for a little visit with the new mother. In this $2 million institution, doors are opened by remote control, and on the single floor, patients are easily moved from place to place. Dream grounds for a dream hospital. The answer to a doctor's prayer. That's right. The answer to the doctor's prayer is not necessarily an answer to the patient's prayers. Um, it's interesting to see how much some things have changed. Um, sometimes when you go back to hospitals, they haven't changed much since the 1950s or earlier. And I had a chance myself to go back to the future. Um, I trained just down the street at Stanford Medical School, did my residency training at uh, Massachusetts General Hospital in Boston, and was recently back there for the 200th anniversary of Mass General. It was a chance to have a reunion with the house staff. These are the guys and girls I trained with back in the day. You can see me there in the, the second row. Um, of course, this is before we had those 80 hour work week restrictions. We were real residents in the trenches. Um, but what was interesting, being back at Mass General was to get an appreciation of a long history. Um, and I was in one of the receptions we had during the anniversary in the old original Bullfinch building at Mass General and wandered upstairs to what's called the Ether Dome. And it's called the Ether Dome because back over 170 years ago, uh, the first patient to get general anesthesia uh, was done right there at Mass General at the Ether Dome. And it's called the, um, it's, uh, 
this picture was of the actual original patient for HIPAA laws, I'm sure. If you go back and visit the Ether Dome today, it's essentially frozen in time. It's a shrine to medical history. You can actually see the actual sponge from that original case in the back of the room. And we got some special meetings there, grand rounds, M&Ms, et cetera, but pretty much frozen in time. And then wander down the hall that night to the ward where I spent my first month as a brand new intern, uh, a young doctor, almost, almost 20 years ago, uh, the Bigelow service at, at Mass General, an amazing service and, and been very historic. And I visited the White Nine Ward where I spent my very first month as an intern. And to my shock and a bit of my dismay, it really hadn't changed much uh, in 20 years or in some parts of the hospital, again, in over 100 years. Um, some of the same alarms were beeping, had a little PTSD, some of the same nurses I recognized, maybe some of the same patients. Uh, only difference was uh, the young doctor on call was pushing on a laptop, had to type the medical record out, print it out, put it in the paper chart. So obviously uh, some things hadn't changed much except that the front desk was still using the cutting edge medical communication tool of our day, the fax machine. So in some ways, medicine hasn't changed in over 150, 160 years. We're still practicing healthcare in silos, in old ways of thinking, old clinical buckets, um, subspecialties that are defined by body part, um, departments and fiefdoms that are, again, with a mindset that may, may go back hundreds or uh, thousands of years. And we have an opportunity as we look into the future and the future of our health to get out of the sick care bucket and move to a true healthcare realm. And what do I mean by sick care? I mean the fact that you know, most of our healthcare systems uh, were based on intermittent uh, and episodic data, meaning you might get an occasional blood pressure check in the clinic, maybe one at home. Uh, you may get an EKG once one every two years. Uh, you may be scribbling down your blood pressure or blood sugar numbers and faxing them to your doctor. So the data loops, the feedback loops are often very intermittent, episodic, or broken. And so far, we're, we're therefore very reactive in our healthcare system. We wait for the heart attack to happen or the stroke to be discovered, uh, not to be discovered, but the stroke to happen, or the lump to be discovered uh, at an advanced stage if it's a cancer. And I would argue with new thinking and some of the new technologies that are already here, we can shift, shift from intermittent and reactive to more continuous and proactive, from things that take you know, a lot of money, take days and weeks to obtain, to things that are instant and connected and rich with data and insights and can be used at the point of care, as opposed to our systems today where the data is often scattered, some on paper, some on electronic medical records. Many of the EMRs, electronic medical records, don't talk to each other. There's data blocking. Lots of opportunity now to unscatter and connect in this new age, and as well as reshape medical education for the individual, for the consumer, the patient, the nurse, the doctor. How do we speed up the discovery elements, some of it brought on by this new connected age, and bring new discoveries to help individuals almost in real time? Because we can shift from this model today where essentially we're stuck in a waiting room on average of 66 minutes in the United States for an average 12 minute primary care visit to whether you're here, whether you're in the Netherlands or in Calcutta, that sort of waiting room mentality is still here. But that's starting to shift. We'll talk more about telemedicine later, but we can shift in this connected age to shift how you own your data, how you connect to your physician, how the healthcare system operates. Now, of course, Technology is wonderful and it's moving quickly and there's some amazing advancements, but the future of our health is not just about technology. It's how it integrates in with our behaviors, our incentives, how medicine is paid for. You know, here in the United States, we're mostly in a fee-for-service world. I, as a physician, get paid to do more procedures, more biopsies, admit more patients, not really to keep people healthier. But as we shift now from volume to value for evidence, not just evidence-based care, but value-based care, we're going to start moving the equation from spending 80% of our care for folks who already have advanced chronic disease to spending more time and attention to rewarding the prevention side, the health wellness elements uh, as we go. So the, the value equation is changing from volume to value, from fee-for-service to outcome-based, from treating just acute episodes to population-based care, from sort of retrospective looks to prospective and predictive models where again, we can shift the equation and not spend our, all our dollars and our time and effort on folks who are already sick. So those are big shifts. Another shift that's happening along with the incentive moves is where does healthcare happen? It's no longer just in the clinic, the emergency room, the ICU. Uh, technology is bringing healthcare outside of the hospital um, to our homes and even onto our bodies. 
And the incentives are often to bring us um, to never admit patients into the hospital in the first place uh, or to treat them in remote ways at lower cost. So that's a shift in element, which is bringing healthcare to our corner pharmacies. They're competing to be the primary care uh, centers of the day, the minute clinics, the Walmarts, the Walgreens. Um, so there's a lot of competition for where does the individual go to get care, uh, their drugs, and how does care, how do the care delivery models change? Some of these diagnostics can happen in the, in the clinic setting as well. Another component which is super interesting is now as an individual, you can, have, you can be much more empowered, not just to own your own health data, but to understand how different hospitals compare. Uh, the sort of Yelp model for comparing uh, best clinical practices and prices for procedures, or sites like GoodRx, where you can compare the, the price on the same drug from one pharmacy across the street to another. There are sites like iodine.com, kind of like a Yelp for drugs, where you can see how does aspirin work in the real world and other drugs, not just the, the formal clinical trial results, but how are real people in the real world experiencing these drugs, both the benefits and side effects. So there's a lot more transparency, and this is, again, changing practice. Uh, for example, the surgeon today um, can be measured, for example, their complication rates. So this is something published by ProPublica last year. You can start to look at surgical scorecards. This has been quite debatable uh, uh, in terms of how well this works, but you can now take a, an elective procedure, for example, a knee replacement procedure. We can now look here in the San Francisco Bay Area at different hospitals that do, do knee replacements, we can dig into an individual hospital and look at their individual surgeons and their complications rates, which are adjusted to various methods. So it's hopefully a normalized uh, complication rate. So one surgeon may be seeing much sicker patients than another. So this needs to be adjusted. This is adjusted data. And you might prefer to go to the doctor with a lower complication rate than one who has a published higher complication rate. Again, this isn't perfect. It's starting to give some transparency and the ability to really measure elements from, in this case, complication rate, Soon we can measure how well did that knee replacement work? Did they need to come in in five years or 10 years for a new one? Lots of possibilities there. So we have new tools as individuals and as consumers to, uh, to have insights into care. And clinicians and patients have new actual tools to impact health and wellness. And one of them, obviously, is something we have in our pockets, the, the smartphone. And by the way, I'm live here on Twitter. If anyone has any questions for me as we go, just hit me up directly on Twitter at my Twitter handle is at Daniel underscore Kraft, K-R-A-F-T. So you can send me questions by Twitter in real time. So a smartphone is an example of a exponential technology that most of us now have in our pockets, a super supercomputer in our pockets. It's living proof of exponentials coming to our daily life, the power of Moore's law, the power of computing. That's um, Moore's law, getting faster and doubling in sort of speed and price about every 18 months. And it's an example of an exponential technology. And one of the takeaways from this talk is, how do you think exponentially? Because that's where the, a lot of the change and disruption is occurring. If you took 30 linear steps, one, two, three, four, five, up to 30, you'd be about 30 meters down the, down the way. But if you're taking 30 exponential steps, doubling, one, two, four, eight, 16, 32, 64, et cetera, you know, by the 15th step, you can kind of do the math. You're at about 32,000. But by that 30th step, you're actually at a billion. That's 26 times around the planet. That's, that's a lot of steps uh, exponentially, a billion steps by that 30th step. That's the power of exponentials. And we're seeing that all around us. That's why the, the, the laptop of, sorry, the desktop of 2000, just 15 years ago, now fits on your smartphone and now fits on your smartwatch and is coming to fit on computers the size of a grain of rice, all of which are starting to be connected. It's Internet of Things, IoT, is coming to the IOH, Internet of Healthcare, or the Internet of the body with very low cost connected devices. And along with these connected small cheap computation, we have a lot of computational power. This little graphic here exemplifies the projection of growth of calculations per second on, on a thousand dollar computer. Here we are right now, boom, in the next five, 10 years, we're gonna have more computing than exists, you know, in my pocket, gonna have more computing than exists in, um, in, in, in the United States or on um, massive uh, supercomputers today. So you need to be thinking exponentially if you're gonna think about how do we shift healthcare? We've seen disruption and, and elements dissolve into our exponential devices. The, the technology you see at the top of the screen is essentially antique. You don't buy a GPS unit or a separate video camera. Those have dissolved 
into your smartphone. And along with this digitization, we're seeing whole technologies dissolve. And this bring, is bringing us interesting opportunities in health and medicine. It's often called digital health or mobile health or connected health. I think soon we'll just call it health. But we can now take what used to be scribbled on notebooks and filed away in, in file cabinets. And that can be your exam data, your lab data, your vaccination record, what meds you're on, your medical history, your environmental exposures, real-time vital signs, and integrate it in smart ways which can shift our healthcare from the prevention and diagnostic and therapy side to how we do clinical trials and, and many other elements uh, in medicine. So that's where things are integrating. And then it's not just you know, Moore's Law and information technology coming together. There's a convergence of everything from robotics, to 3D printing, to nanotechnology, to, to big data and material science that are all coming together. And that's where a lot of the convergence and new solutions are happening. And we need this, our exponential thinking, if we're gonna address grand challenges in healthcare from the rising costs, the aging demographic in most parts of the Western world, access to care. Uh, we have in the United States more access to insurance, but there's still a shortage of primary care physicians and specialists. We do medicine differently for the same issue in, in, in the Netherlands and New York and San Francisco. How do we pick the exact right data and procedure for that patient? We're in an era of big data streaming at us, but how do we make that actionable information that you can use as an individual or a physician that I can use in the clinic in real time? It's not just big data, it's small data that we can use and again, make useful for that exact use case. And how do we reduce a lot of the waste? We spend 30% of our dollar uh, today essentially often on repeating tests and taxing records. And finally, how do our regulatory bodies, the FDA or the EMA, start thinking exponentially? How do they start reinventing clinical trials using mobile and sensors and big data? I was just at Stanford yesterday at the big data conference and met with the new FDA commissioner and they're definitely thinking about how to keep up uh, in the regulatory process with some of these new technologies. Not perfect, we need to make safety a priority, but we can hopefully speed up and improve our regulatory process as we go. And the payers as well, those, whether it's the National Health Service or Blue Cross or Anthem or many of the payers around the planet also have a major role in addressing these challenges. Because we all want improved healthcare at lower costs, um, for, for all of us. And it's not just this triple aim, I think, that's important. It's also sometimes what's the missing aim, the quadruple aim. This idea that not just improving it for patients, but improving the experience for, for physicians. A lot of physicians are burning out. They're overwhelmed by data and having to type things into medical records. We need to make technology play into the whole quadrants, all these quadrants, as we move forward. So as we reimagine healthcare, we can look at examples from disruption happening all around us. Many of you have experienced Uber. Uber is an example of an exponential uh, company. They're only, what, six years old. They didn't invent most of their technologies that they use. They connected the dots. Smartphones, mobile, online maps, uh, online payments are all moving exponentially to the smartphone platform. They didn't invent the limo or the cab, but they connected the dots and have transformed transportation and have a billion, $50 billion valuation. And many people now want the Uber of healthcare, this ease and transparency and and consumerism to come to healthcare. Uber themselves even did a, a pilot last year called Uber Health, press a button on the app, and a nurse would come and give you a flu shot, right? That might enable a lot of folks who can't travel easily to get their vaccinations. And now there are dozens of companies literally building Ubers for house calls, for press a button on the app and a doctor comes to you. And my usual joke is you, what kind of doctor? You don't know exactly what one you're going to get, but with these sort of platforms, just like with Uber or, uh, eBay, you can rate them and they can rate you. So it holds folks accountable in a social contract as well uh, and can help weed out the bad apples and raise up those who are, who are terrific and have five stars. Um, we're seeing kind of Ubers for drug delivery uh, where you'll never walk into a pharmacy. It can be delivered by a courier or maybe soon by a drone. So those are just a few examples of disruption coming. Um, you need to be thinking exponentially in whatever field that you're going to be. And if you don't want to be, let's say, the next Kodak, Kodak, as you may know, invented digital photography, didn't pay attention to the digital, to the quick speed of digital photography and its, its exponential pace. Three, four years ago, they're bankrupt and just down the street from me in Palo Alto, 12 kids had uh, sold uh, Instagram for a billion dollars. So if you're thinking exponentially, you can avoid being, let's say, the next blockbuster or Blackberries, it may be. And some of those lessons can apply to healthcare. We're seeing disruption come to our friends in pharma, companies like Oscar Health, 
already have over a almost $3 billion valuation trying to reshape how you do uh, the payer world. We're seeing pharma being struggling with how do they reinvent themselves in this era of personalized medicine where it's not one drug for everybody, it needs to be tuned. And how do we connect the, the dots in the pharma world? So I think it's up to all of us to think disruptively, think exponentially, think convergently as we rethink our future healthcare moving into, into uh, the present day and uh, in the next few years and decades. So I get to spend uh, some time looking at the future of healthcare, sharing the medicine side of Singularity University. And uh, I've been on the founding faculty since it started back in 2008, 2009. And it's a pretty incredible place. It's based in the heart of Silicon Valley. Um, I share the side, the medicine side, but there are also tracks in biotechnology, robotics, 3D printing, nanotechnology. You can learn a lot, about, a lot more about Singularity University at singularityu.org. And we put on educational programs, we have incubators, accelerators, think tanks, summits. But the main concept is to bring today's leaders and future leaders together to understand uh, the pace of exponential technologies, um, where they're coming together, how we can converge them to address big challenges, whether that's poverty, education, uh, the environment, energy. And what's been really interesting in our 10-week summer programs, our global solutions program, and our one-week executive programs and our summits, a lot of the new ideas are coming together to address problems in healthcare, uh, particularly in democratizing uh, health and medicine around the planet. And because so many folks are interested in healthcare that come from different worlds, IT, drones, robotics, big data, uh, five years ago, I put together and founded a program called Exponential Medicine, and we bring together folks from across the spectrum, different kinds of doctors and nurses, pharmacists, technologists, innovators, We've now grown the program more than exponentially. It's held now in the fall at the Hotel Del Coronado in San Diego. Um, this year it will be actually October uh, 8th through 16th. Uh, the website's exponentialmedicine.com. And it's a magical mix of amazing faculty, breakout workshops, um, a mix of demos. Um, and it's pretty magical. When, again, we unsilo folks from different fields of healthcare and technology and bring them all together. So hopefully some of you can join us this October 8th through 11th, you can apply at exponentialmedicine.com. Many of our lectures, uh, folks like Lucy Engelin um, and, uh, and John Madison and others who are at the our Future Health event uh, in, in uh, Netherlands today, were there and will be there again this year. And uh, everyone gets scrubs. Here's a picture of our group shot this year taken by drones. Drones, another technology has come down exponentially. You can buy an amazing drone for 100 US dollars today and take videos uh, just like this. All right. Let's take a look now at a few areas and how they're shifting with technology um, and how they can apply to you as an individual and reshaping health and medicine across the spectrum. So first of all, health and wellness. Um, your long-term health and wellness is often tied much less to your underlying genetics um, than to your behaviors. Um, your behaviors are really impactful. And um, let's say in this case, you should see the eight most risky behaviors from diet, to physical activity, to smoking, to stress, to poor sleep, drive the most common chronic conditions, chronic conditions, which drives most or 80% or so of the chronic illnesses we have across the planet. So we can get a handle on our behaviors, we can start to play a role in really shifting our downstream uh, health. And now we have new tools, obviously, to do that. We're now in this wearable age, right? And these wearables are crossing the whole spectrum. They're not, they're not just uh, on your wrist, on your wrist for tracking um, your steps and your sleep. Uh, for for some few, a few examples, you know, the Misfit Shine now is integrating into jewelry and has eight month uh, battery life. We're seeing Misfit being acquired by fashion companies, so we're seeing fashion start to to integrate into um, into uh, all sorts of elements of wearable devices and behavior change. And the big takeaway from this now is that you as an individual can start to own your health data. You can be integrating into clinical trials. You can choose to share that data with your physician. It's no longer that the doctor paternalistically tells you what to do, it's that you can be, maybe not the CEO of your health, CEO of your health, but at least the COO, the co-pilot to your care. You can take this data and share it with your social networks. Uh, my friend, Brett Bullington, who's an investor and technologist in the Bay Area, had a very bad bicycle accident a few years ago, and part of his recovery was fostered through his social network and sharing his connected health data. Here he shared recently that hit, he hit 8 million steps on his jawbone device, and he's been sleeping an average of 9 hours and 40 minutes per night 
tremendously helpful for recovery from traumatic brain injury. And he shares that data. So I think we're moving from this purely consumer realm of quantified self to a realm of often what's called, I think, or I call it quantified health. The data from these technologies can not just be stuck on your wrist, but it can start to flow back to your healthcare provider and give you global insights. And we're moving beyond sort of the, the simple accelerometer on your wrist to sensors 3.0, you know, RFID pills that are ingestible on your, on your pills themselves to track medical adherence. We're seeing glucometers that talk to your smartphone um, and can give you dashboards for diabetics. Uh, and some of these glucose reading elements will be uh, digital tattoos. We're seeing a whole new interesting realm of electro patches, sort of digital tattoos that can track everything from your sweat to uh, potentially uh, blood sugar uh, and other elements. So really interesting shrinking technologies. We're seeing quantified technologies can, can look at your swims or your tennis serves and, your, and improve your, your sporting activities, measure how, how, how good your muscles are if you're into weightlifting. They can be used to track kids who are playing football or rugby or soccer and, and be proactive in terms of preventing concussions. So we're really changing this landscape from just wearables to even the idea of incitables, a term coined by my friend Lucy Mangler, who heads up our future health. And citables, contact lenses, being made by companies like Google, of all people, partnering with Big Pharma to bring those to market. So diabetics can painlessly and in real time measure uh, essentially blood sugar. We're going from incitables to this idea of trainables, something that can give you feedback in essentially real time. What might be an example of that? Well, in our smartphone and laptop era today, we're often not having the best posture. What if your wearable could give you feedback, a little buzz in your back? This is a Israeli company with a new technology called the Upright. You put that on the back, you use it for a few minutes a day, and it starts to give you feedback. And after just a few days of using the app and this wearable technology, your physiology can get rewired and your posture can dramatically improve, which can improve issues like chronic lower back pain. So what if a physician or a physical therapist could prescribe like this to a patient? Maybe you need other feedback loops, shockables. You know, Pavlov is onto something, might give you other elements to change. Hearables. I have actually a Bluetooth headset from Braggy Dash. It's not only great for listening to music, but it also gives me real-time heart rate data and tracks my steps. So all these things can shrink into a little uh, Bluetooth headset and track your health wellness uh, in many interesting ways. Ringables. Rings. This is the Aura ring that can be a sleep rag, sleep lab on your, fa on your ring. Sleep. So important. Something I don't have a lot of with a newborn at home. Um, it's such an important part of health. Now you can start to measure that at home. Don't need to go to a sleep lab. Measuring stress, stressables are being developed. Here's even something, a new device, effortlessly monitor, your, monitor your, your blood alcohol level. So I think if you need to do that, you might have some other issues, but there's measurable elements for almost anything today. And some of these are being integrated into individual devices. So a lot of these wearable devices from Apple Watches to Fitbits to Jogos, many of those are gonna be commoditized. We'll see those integrate into our clothes, into our environments. You may have a wearable shirt today that can track your triathlon, and soon this will help track patients with chronic diseases um, in very smart, continuous ways. Or if you're a pregnant woman and you're trying to decide, uh, are those real contractions? Is it time to go to the hospital? Uh, it might be helpful to have a wearable on your, on your body or in your, in your maternity wear. And once the baby's here, Maybe you could track some of its other health-related elements. This is one of my favorite graphics from Wired Magazine. It was a kind of a take at the future, artifacts from the future, the connected diaper. But actually, the future is coming faster than you think. Huggies actually came out with a real tweet pee device a couple of years ago. So you can imagine what you can measure with that. Or there are ways to measure other elements of uh, children's output, per se, which can be useful in certain, certain clinical uh, uh, systems. I'm actually trained in internal medicine and pediatrics. What if we could send our children home from the pediatric intensive care unit or uh, with a wearable device or a connected teddy bear that could track their health at home before we might need to keep them in the hospital for extra days. Now we can do that at home. This is my son uh, a couple years ago uh, doing his part for medicine wearing a connected onesie. Now that's useful maybe to track his sleep. He's waking up every two hours. Great. But again, if if uh, you're tracking a child with a medical issue, these can be very helpful. Or connected binkies uh, to track temperature. Lots of creative ways we're seeing connected devices used 
track health. And these, again, are changing and getting more um, measuring other things like sweat. This is a smart uh, wristband that can track different components in sweat. Well, this one just published in Nature, a wearable device that tracks, a patch that tracks not only heart rate, but lactate, which again might be useful in a variety of realms. Um, so lots of things are coming. The trick is how do we integrate that? Because no one wants to log into 10, 10 different devices and wearables. There are other things we can measure, by the way, that aren't just straightforward vital signs. Your breath quality. This is a, a company called Breathometer, coming out with a technology called the Mint. It can track the quality of your breath. Um, do you have good breath if you're going out on a date? Uh, how well hydrated are you, which might be measured by your breath? We're now able to pick up certain diseases from molecules in your respiratory tract. So we might use these as early detections for certain cancers. So think about quantifying breath in certain ways. What about even using the cameras on our smart tablets and phones and computers and laptops? Using software now, you can look at video streams in real time or retroactively and pick up heart rate. Not only can you pick up heart rate, you can pick up someone's, are they lying or not? So interestingly now using transdermal optical imaging with a simple camera, you can pick up how, how hot someone's face is. It turns out, uh, there's a great TED talk on this recently, that when folks lie, their noses get a little bit warm. So what if you can pick up heart rate and warmth in the nose, you might pick up on who's lying or not. It might be very interesting in the future of, of political debates to be uh, picking those up in real time, for example. So that layers into measuring our emotional state, our stress level, what our underlying emotions are. This is a, an Israeli company called Beyond Verbal and makes a product where it can just listen to your uh, voice and kind of pick up what your actual emotions are. This is the uh, famous uh, Patriots quarterback Tom Brady about a year ago in the Deflate Gate episode when he was having a press conference. The software is reading his, his emotions, defenses, projection of authority from position of weakness, self-confidence and self-control in case of struggle. It's kind of insightful in terms of what he's actually communicating just from his voice, natural leadership, struggle, disappointment possible, hopes and dreams. Well, you can actually try this software. You can download it on iPhone Android called the Moody's app and go out there and see whether your spouse or boss is really angry at you or not and, and experiment, see if, it, if it's uh, working for you. But this is just the beginning of measuring our mental health and our emotional states through our smart platforms. Ginger.io is a, is a pioneering a software platform that tracks mental health. You can imagine a patient with bipolar, bipolar disorder. They're going to act differently when they're manic or they're depressed. This platform and others like it can pick up mental state and be used even to pick up biomarkers of suicidality. So really interesting realms now where your mobile device can not only measure your mental health, but also give you virtual hugs or call your psychologist or your care team when, let's say, a bipolar patient is moving into mania or into depression. Really impactful, uh, I think, promises there for the future of, of psychi psychiatry and mental health. We can start to quantify things uh, also from our smart homes. Our, our homes are increasingly connected. And it turns out that um, simply using Wi-Fi may be a new form of picking up vital signs from 10 people in the same room. So this is published from MIT last year. Uh, and they're able to pick up, uh, again, vital signs from folks in cribs, 10 people in the same room. So our connected homes, how do we use those to measure our health? And now what happens with our new connected, healthy homes? Um, I recently got an Amazon Echo. You can ask it to play music, what's the weather, to order things from the store. Uh, Google uh, Health, is uh, sorry, Google Home was just announced. So imagine when these start to play a role in tracking your health. You might be a diabetic. You can ask how many calories in your pizza maybe connected to your glucometer, what your blood sugar trends are doing, reminding you to take your medications, or Alexa, help, I've fallen I have, and I need to get up and call 911. All those things may be enabled by these new platforms coming out from Amazon and Google, and recently I think Apple may be coming out with it as well. So um, ways to monitor us in our environment and help keep us healthy and safe if we're uh, going off in the wrong direction. So this leads us now to an interesting era. We're becoming online with our healthcare data, our digital exhaust, 24-7. Um, I would argue we want to unplug, it's good for our, our, our brains as well, but with this digital exhaust, uh, as exemplified with, you know, what can be measured on our smartphones and smartwatches, it provides interesting opportunities. 
Um, you might be familiar with Google Now. It uh, measures your, looks at your calendar, looks at the traffic, says, hey, Daniel, it's time to leave early to get to the airport based on a traffic jam. What if we had Google Now that was integrating data and reminded you to check into the gym? Or as my Apple Watch already does, reminds me to stand up because sitting is the new smoking. Um, the challenge with these today often is they're not super contextual. My Apple Watch doesn't know that I'm giving a talk right now or riding in a car or flying across the country. So these are going to learn you and be much more smart and contextual. Uh, and you'll get this data almost anywhere. You know, you can be measuring things and providing data in interesting places. Again, I would urge all of us for, the, for our own mental health to unplug occasionally from Facebook and Twitter and the web. But the bottom line is, with all this new big data coming at us, we can start to measure it in interesting ways. The question is going to be the sort of, so what? What do we do with this? How do we make it useful and actionable? So I think we don't, have to, we don't have to think about it putting a sensor on and charging the battery. We want them minimally invasive and reliable and easy and, and frictionless. We want them to deliver that information to ourselves and to our clinical teams uh, in a useful way, not just a data stream way. So we need algorithms to extract the data and make it useful and put it into the workflow of the clinician. And we're starting to see this happen. Platforms like Apple's HealthKit and uh, and Google, which has just announced that their new version of HealthKit is going to be a health data exchange. So the data from my scale, my blood pressure graph, my glucometer, my apps can all flow through one platform. And just in 2015, in the last year, we've started to see ways for the data to flow from things like ResearchKit and HealthKit into uh, actual electronic medical records. Still very early, but the, the data flow and the pipes are opening up. So... Uh, it's interesting to see Google, Apple, Samsung, and others start to play in this space, uh, and it's going to really make a big difference. Google, or now Verily, is doing a baseline study. What does this digital exhaust mean? We often don't uh, know what normal digital exhaust is going to look like, so we're going to see, I think, new ways of measuring uh, all this information, integrating it from not just our wearable device, but integrating with our omics um, to our clinical stores and understanding what individual baselines are so that you can normalize and get a bit of a, a healthcare score. Uh, here in the United States, for our financial health, we have a FICO score. What if we had a FICO score for health that integrates not just our basic physiology and how many steps we've taken, but our, our mental health, our social health, our network, uh, our, our sexual health, all these things that blend into our wellness, which go well beyond just tracking vital signs and lab data. So. Um, it's an interesting era. There's lots of things you can play with now to track things like your sleep. And again, sleep being such a critical importance. Um, some folks have gone out there like uh, uh, Dr. Winter to compare different devices. Um, and again, I don't think we want to look at the raw data. We want to integrate it. I'm, I'm experimenting now with this uh, little sensor from bedded underneath my mattress. And what's interesting is it gives you an integrated sleep score. Uh, it's integrating how much time I had, how long I went to sleep, my efficiency can track my heart rate, again, from the mattress. Um, and here was a good night at 90. Here's not such a good night with a score of 68 where I might have woken up several times. And wouldn't it be interesting to look at my scores of sleep over weeks or months or years to help prevent uh, an advent of a severe illness and predict it before it happens? Because what we want to do with this explosion of connected devices and data is not just look at the raw data, but give us some insights into the, the trends, the trend lines. I call it predictalytics. What is the data trend line going to mean? Just like a good intensive care unit doctor will look at a, a swath of, of data uh, and they'll start to go, wow, this, this patient's getting septic based on the blood pressure and the temperature and the heart rate. I think we can do the same thing with our digital health exhaust. And it's going to bring us to an era kind of like a check engine light for the body. Modern cars have 300, 400 sensors in them. You don't want to look at the data from any one sensor. You want your own personal check engine light to be tuned to you. If you're driving a VW Bug or a Tesla, very different sensors and data streams, but it needs to be tuned to your individual uh, element. And just like we see now platforms that ride on top of your car, like the OnStar system, it can integrate this and call 911 if you crash your car or help give you directions. I think we'll see uh, new platforms uh, and whole potentials for new industries integrating the commoditization of these devices and data feeds. So, it's still important as a consumer, as an individual, as a patient, to be honest with ourselves and what's really happening with our health. With our health. And sometimes it's hard to do with your own physician 
It turns out we're more honest often with our, our smartphones and our digital uh, data, that d digital realms than our, with our doctors. And that leads to this idea of behavior change and coaching. If we can share that data in reliable ways, we can really enable our physicians and health coaches to play a role in helping nudge us and move us forward. We're now seeing the advent of digital coaching platforms where you can be connected to a real life coach that can connect to you on things like FaceTime, uh, one from Vita.com, Goki is an example. We just have real people on the other end. There's now artificial intelligence versions of app, uh, apps like the Lark app, which has uh, been out for a couple of years, really terrific app where it has an AI interacting with you, a bit of a chat bot that learns your data, what your normals are, compares you to others, helps keep you on, on track for diet or exercise, and I think will be very useful uh, in the new future for managing chronic and acute diseases. It can remind me today that I didn't get much sleep. I need to go to bed early. So really interesting realms of digital coaching. This company is a Singularity University company, uh, AXI. Uh, they have a platform called TESS, where it's basically a chatbot for uh, folks who need some psychological support. You can see some of the messages in there. It can help call in real help if you need it or just provide some touch points, some, some digital empathy. We're seeing companies like Sensely uh, develop platforms where you're talking to a bit of a digital avatar. In this case, Molly, the medical assistant, asks how that she can help you. And you may say, well, I just came back from Vegas and I, I have this funny rash, a fever and a rash on my arm. Um, and through this platform, it might ask you a few questions, suggest what you might have, and uh, triage you to a real doctor, a real dermatologist, uh, or elsewhere uh, through a, a video consult. So lots of ways these sort of coaches and platforms are coming together. Some are coming together even in interesting ways. Take a look at the robotic coach coming to a home near you. Meet the world's first artificial intelligence personal robot. She's your welcome friend at any hour. Good morning, Thomas. Time to get up. Good morning. It seems like you had a good night's sleep. Eight full hours and a good resting heart rate. Thank you. Your meeting with Jane is at 9.30. I put the coffee on. She can interface with household devices. And she's also a personal stylist. What do you think? Why don't you try the blue tie with it? Yeah. She's your world-class office assistant using artificial intelligence algorithms to analyze data quickly and efficiently. We plan to run a marketing campaign on the Upper East Side of New York. What do you think about that neighborhood? This neighborhood has a very promising outlook for this campaign with 25,000 housing units. Also, 82% of people living there have a college degree. So you can see some uh, examples there have a uh, interactive sort of robot tied to artificial intelligence and big data can be helpful for your individual coaching, but also helping you at work or giving you insights into public health. So imagine this smart coach isn't just stuck on your shelf or on a robot, could be in your mirror. What if you looked in the mirror in the morning uh, and it was your coach and it could show you uh, a little bit about your physiology and how you slept that night, uh, give you some coaching around uh, your vital signs and what meds you might be taking or uh, what gym might be open that day. This is an example of an early prototype. Um, but we'll see these sort of digital coaches emerge. Um, and what's exciting there is they can give you a, a little look at future you. You know, if you keep smoking or eating a lot or unhealthy behaviors, what's future you going to look like? Or if you're inspired to see future in your mirror when you work out and you're really staying on top of things, what might future you look like? Or again, if you keep having donuts for breakfast, what's future you going to look like in the mirror? That can be a very powerful lever for behavior change. Here's me before. Here's me a thousand donuts later. I may pause just a little bit before I have that extra donut in the morning. Or if I'm talking to a patient who's smoking and I can show her what her face is gonna look like smoking two or three packs a day in a few years, that could be a powerful level. So that, or, um, so smoking, before smoking, after smoking, on that individual patient's face. And that's an interesting example of augmented reality, or if you spend too much time on Facebook, by the way, also not that great for you. But these are examples of blending behavior change and augmented reality. And augmented reality and virtual reality, another field, a set of fields that are coming together really quickly to play a role in healthcare. We had the lead for Google Glass come to one of our exponential medicine programs right before, a few months before anyone had seen it. And several of our physicians who were our participants were the very first to bring uh, uh, Google Glass into the operating room to, to stream surgeries, use it for teaching or to pull up patient vital sign data. So lots of ways these early versions of augmented reality are already being impactful. We're seeing ways that you can blend clinical data 
with the, the physician in this case, layering ultrasound data to learn where to best do a clinical intervention. We're seeing companies like HoloLens come out using these things for education, uh, for communication. Uh, increasingly, they're applying these to healthcare. So they partnered with uh, Case Western for the medical school there to use HoloLens to teach anatomy. Here you see a very interesting example of a medical student using the, the HoloLens to, to learn anatomy, and they can be doing that in a classroom setting or remotely to collaborate on learning uh, anatomy together. So very interesting ways to bring low-cost, democratized uh, education for anatomy and beyond. What about um, uh, other things you could use with things like Google Glass? What about autism patients? This company called BrainPower is using uh, Google Glass to enable autistic children to understand emotional states. So in this case, this child has autism, uses the uh, Google Glass to use the emotion game. Looking at his mother, he can start to learn when she's happy, when she's angry, the Google Glass can help do the interpretation. So a very clever and uh, potentially very impactful way of using uh, uh, augmented reality for a very particular uh, subset of patients. What about augmented reality in our daily lives? Um, I was at the TED conference back in February we got to have an amazing demo of the Meta platform. Meta is one of the leading augmented reality companies here in Silicon Valley. Really incredible to put on this headset and be able to interact with uh, virtual bodies and, and use that for anatomy potentially, or to interact with screens and move them around you, interact with multiple objects. Again, you're seeing through the screens, so you can be in the real world at the same time. And I think as the founder of Meta said, in five years we may be throwing away our computer screens and using these sets of platforms in many different realms. It could be an anesthesiologist, or a surgeon, or a patient, or a healthcare executive. Um, lots of potential uh, for augmented reality moving forward. What about virtual reality? You know, putting yourself into a totally different sort of headspace. Obviously, that's moving quickly. Most of you know about the Oculus Rift. Uh, I just received mine last week. I'm still waiting for the computer so it can run. That's the expensive version of augmented re of virtual reality. But you can also offer almost free use things like Google Cardboard put your smartphone in there and have pretty amazing access to a wide variety of, of virtual reality experiences. And these have been leveraged by doctors to look at um, MRI and imaging data. In this case, uh, this surgeon was able to save a baby's life by looking at the cardiac data and, and coming up with a, a new surgical approach. Um, we're seeing these being used in the operating room. Dr. Shafi Ahmad, a surgeon in London, has pioneered using virtual reality surgery where they record surgeries in real time. So these can be used as educational platforms. You can record a surgery, and when you put on your, your virtual reality headset, you're seeing all around that case, just like you're in the, live, in the operating room. And I actually had the honor of being in London just about uh, six weeks ago when they did the very first live virtual reality operation. This is through medical realities. We're in the operating room, and they're live streaming, in this case, for about two or 3,000 people in real time, this actual surgery. It's done laparoscopically. And you could be in the operating room and actually put on the, the Google Cardboard and be watching a very different view of the surgery, very meta. But I think this could be the future of medical education, both recorded and live streamed, uh, and just the beginning of what we can do with augmented virtual reality. It could even play a role in the future of exercise and prevention. Imagine you know, being on the treadmill or on the, on the spin bike, but being in different environments, uh, gamifying that, uh, optimizing it to your brain. Uh, and helping you concentrate and optimizing for certain muscle groups. Lots of potential there. A really cool area that I also got to experience at the TED conference coming from a company called The Void is the idea of blending the 3D with the 4D world. So you can actually walk through a virtual reality world. Take a look, this is how it works. You put on a virtual reality headset, uh, a full-on VR headset, you wear um, a vest that gives you tactile feedback, and with somebody else who's also wearing this, you go into an actual environment. So virtual worlds built over physical environments. Here's a, a taste of what that's like. And you can see here, you're actually in this physical environment. You feel the rain. You walk and feel the ledge, you touch things, you hold things, you see that, you feel this, but you're seeing something like this. So a really powerful, interesting modality, imagine how that could be used for treating folks with 
PTSD or medical education where you can walk through a heart or through a brain and, and feel it and touch it. So I think a lot of interesting opportunities there. Another world that's moving exponentially uh, is the world of personal genomics. Um, you're now able to access your own personal genetics. And the cost of sequencing a genome, incredibly, has dropped at twice the rate of Moore's Law, but was millions of dollars today, has dropped to basically a $1,000 genome. The challenge still is how do we work that into the workflow of a doctor? If one of you came to me with your genome on a disk drive, I still might have a challenge of you know, knowing what I could do with that. Oops. Um, and what's incredible about this now, in this new age, is that uh, this is basically in, you know, more, more than an encyclopedia worth of data. This is work done at Human Longevity Incorporated. This is Craig Venter's genome. And they've learned by machine learning that they can extract and understand from someone's genome what their facial structure, what the individual's facial structure is likely to look like, as well as the patient's individual's height, a weight, a BMI, skin color, eye color. How can that be extracted from your genome? So some really interesting privacy and other elements there. But today, and many of you may have done this, you can start to interact with your own genome. Companies like 23andMe are consumer genetics companies. Do you know? So spit it in two, drop it in the mail, and you can learn about your genealogy, but also about the genes that impact your pharmacogenetics, what drugs, what genes you have impact, what drug and what dose you might want to take. So here's my 23andMe data. There's some drugs that I might want to adjust based on my genetics. We're now in an era of a $999 full genome. I just ordered mine, I got the kit from Veritas Genetics, which will provide a full genome for under $1,000. That's today, imagine in two or five years, a full genome may be $100 or $10, or maybe even three. A lot of interesting implications there as we can democratize the access to genomic information. And now companies like Illumina are spinning out platforms like Helix, uh, which is going to be an app store for your genome, where you might have your genome in the cloud, pay a subscription model, and glean new information from that over time. An example of a company doing something like that today is Athletogen. I can take my 23andMe data, which I own, download it, upload it to Athletogen, and look at my genes that relate to my athletic ability. And interestingly, um, I was always a fast sprinter. You can look at and see my score there for metabolic efficiency, 77, pretty good. I was never very good at cross country. Uh, my endurance genes there show up at 34, I guess out of 100, not great. I wasn't a good cross country runner. And while I wanna get up and do my morning workouts, sometimes I have trouble, but I have an excuse. As you see on the left, my motivation genes are low, <laughs> 30, 27. So while this isn't perfect data, it's integration of complex information that I can use and potentially be actionable. And this kind of information is gonna flow to physicians, to athletes, to trainers, and be made uh, accessible. So I encourage you all to try personal genomics today and start to share that information with your own doctor, hopefully improve your wellness, prevention, diagnostics, and therapy. Now, of course, this opens up a whole can of worms. If you haven't seen the movie Gattaca, which is almost a 20-year-old movie, very insightful, a lot of elements about privacy and um, uh, how we use this information. Um, and a lot of ethical in, in, uh, complexities, which we don't have time to go into now, but uh, I would encourage you to watch this movie to give you some uh, proactive insights. So once we have genomes from thousands and millions of patients, we can start to do some really interesting things. Joel Dudley, uh, who is at um, uh, in New York, is a very uh, amazing biomedical researcher, now leveraging thousands of genomes and applying machine learning on top of those and algorithms to extract, in this case, in type two diabetes, are actually three different subtypes. Uh, and he, is in, he and his colleagues from Mount Sinai published this uh, just a few months ago. Imagine not just treating a diabetic as all the same, we can start to subset them uh, into different forms and different classes and, and treat them with different drugs and diets. It's just a small example. And we're going now well beyond the genome we're in the era of proteomics, thousands of biomarkers from your blood. The exposome, where you've lived, your smartphone knows if you spent time in Beijing or grew up on a farm or in Manhattan, those exposures are gonna be quite different and your risks are based on those. How about your microbiome? Something we can now measure for less than $100 uh, is becoming very important in healthcare. Your microbiome impacts obesity, inflammatory bowel disease, maybe even psychiatric disorders. We're learning that we can treat patients who have infections in their gut with microbiome transplants called fecal transplants. Not very sexy, 
but uh, can be hugely impactful in saving lives with folks with C. difficile infections. And now today, you can go out there, companies like Ubiome at ubiome.com, uh, started by a Singularity University graduate, enable you to send some swabs in the mail and for less than $80, have your whole microbiome uh, done. So uh, it's a really interesting era uh, where we can start to crowdsource this data as well and learn how your microbiome plays a role in everything uh, from psych psychiatric disorders to obesity. And including in newborns, if a child is born by C-section as opposed to by vaginal birth, uh, the child gets a different microbiome from the mother, which seems to play a role in the long-term long health of, of the baby over its whole lifespan. So really interesting things we're learning when the exponentials involved in low-cost genomics. Um, just to touch here for a second on food. Food is a drug. I mean, it's so important to our health. We're now starting to gain insights and ways to adjust our food. There are new food technologies. This company called Juicero is particularly interesting. They're making like the uh, uh, Kura coffee cup uh, model for uh, real fresh juices from vegetables and plants and, uh, and uh, uh, vegetables and fruits which you can have in the home. Uh, we're learning from companies like Google how you display your food in the workplace, for example, can change how many calories are taken in. So how you design the environment in your cafeteria, do you put the healthy food early in the, in the, in the cafeteria, changes how many calories and how much healthy food folks take in. How about other... Uh, technologies impacting health, wellness, and medicine. Some of them are old school technologies like meditation and yoga. How they impact our, our brains can be measured now and even in real time. There are now consumer brain computer interfaces, BCIs. Companies like Interaxon Muse can enable you to wear a headset and track your brain activity. This can be used in gamifying mindfulness or meditation. Um, so many applications there to help our mental health, our stress levels. It's being, these are being used now to, to take kids who have attention deficit disorder, enable them to play the game and learn how to focus. And when they take the headset on, off, they're more focused and they can get off of drugs like Ritalin. So interesting applications there. So we're seeing uh, maybe brain computer interface and virtual reality pods you may bring to your workplace or to the clinic to help folks uh, relax. We're seeing companies like Think apply wearables to your brain that can apply energy in and might improve your cognition uh, 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 and your mood uh, in really interesting ways. So the idea of hacking your brain is uh, coming, uh, is already here. Um, not FDA approved for specific indications, uh, but being experimented on in different, in different realms. There's some very good data behind it. So brain computer interfaces are getting super interesting and in the most impactful ways can really start to enable the disabled. This is work from my alma mater, Brown University. Uh, the brain gate trials where they have a small motor cortex, uh, chip on the motor cortex, which is in this case enabling um, this woman who's paralyzed from the waist down to control a robotic limb. And the new versions of this are going to be smaller and more integrated underneath the skin and Bluetooth. So we're going to start to not just enable the disabled, but super enable them, sometimes connecting them to robotic limbs or back to their own arm, for example. Other ways to impact our brains is not just through... Uh, 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 drugs, but maybe through things like video games. Uh, my friend and colleague Adam Gazale at UCSF is leading a really interesting element where they're looking at the impact of video gaming as a game changer. Video games to enhance cognitive skills that decline with age. It's just one example. They studied the, uh, as we age, our ability to multitask goes down. Playing a pretty simple game on a tablet could improve that dramatically and maintain that over months. They've now been able to combine that with uh, movement, for example, on an Xbox. So we'll see ways that gaming and video gaming might be prescribed for a whole variety of elements to improve your cognition or to treat elements from dementia to other uh, cognitive de deficits. So watch that space. Very interesting. So we have about 30 minutes left. Again, you can tweet at me questions at Daniel underscore craft on Twitter. I'll try and respond in real time, which is the magic of, of uh, our, our age. Um, but uh, one thing we'll switch now to is the future of diagnostics because it's, I think, particularly helpful to pick up disease at early stage rather than we, where we usually pick it up late. Let's take, for example, Alzheimer's, major, a major cause of dementia. We pick it up late as a chronic disease in most cases. What if, using some of the new imaging modalities, PET scans, blood-based biomarkers, personal genomics, we can pick up uh, who's going to get Alzheimer's 10 or 
15 or, or more years early. That's already being done today. Then maybe if we're like, we have a patient likely to get Alzheimer's 10 years later, we can be proactive and give them, uh, and there's actually eye tracking software from NeuroTrack, for example, that can be diagnostic. Maybe some of the new drugs that are in clinical trials that can stop or reverse plaques can be given before a patient has any clinical signs of Alzheimer's. So a big game changer there in treating um, some dementias at stage zero as opposed, to, as opposed to stage three or four. We're also entering an era now of a digital doctor's bag, a whole new slew of technologies that used to live in the clinic that can now be democratized almost anywhere from, uh, from doing eye exams to glucometers to this example, the uh, otoscope, cell scope, which you can send home with your pediatric uh, patients to look in their ear and do ear exams remotely. Now, of course, hopefully the pediatrician is incentivized to use these platforms, but a very powerful, easy way to do remote diagnostics and disease management. Or old school analog devices like a stethoscope are now being digitized. The echo device attaches to an analog stethoscope and gives you a digital signal so you can record heart sounds. The app can maybe help analyze those. You can share those with your medical students or the patient. The stethoscope is probably going away, as Eric Tobel often points out. Uh, he has a, one of the beautiful new Philips uh, Lumify um, pocket ultrasounds that connect right to a smartphone or a tablet. You can, at very low cost, have a super stethoscope and ultrasound in the pocket of almost any clinician and now use machine learning and AI to read those images for you. You don't need to be a fully trained radiologist to analyze them. So lots of diagnostics are coming from hearing aid tests that can be announced to whole slews of technologies integrating into a single device like the MedWan or the Tyco device out of Israel. Diagnosing, diagnosing, diagnosing skin lesions is set to change. There's already e-dermatologies in many settings. Uh, there's apps that have now uh, been developed, um, like First Derm, where you can take a picture, send it to a real dermatologist, and they'll send you back a uh, diagnosis. But now we're seeing these becoming appified and being embedded with machine learning and other diagnostics. So the app itself, they say, is that a melanoma or a mole? So very powerful elements coming together to disrupt the field of dermatology or radiology or pathology. These are fields that are very dependent on pattern recognition, take many years of training. Some of those will be supplanted, I think, uh, by, by the machine learning elements. We're gonna change the way we do eye exams. This is the old version, new versions out of MIT, iNetra. We used to do those exams uh, remotely. And interestingly, iNetra did the first trials in India. They can not only do the front of the eye, but the back of the eye which is really important in tracking certain diseases. Uh, they did the first trials in India where there's very few optometrists, very few ophthalmologists. And now they've brought that technology back to the United States in a sort of appified version called Blink. Press a button on the app, and a technologist comes to you and does their eye exam with these uh, mobile technologies. So diagnostics is shifting, sometimes to the point where we can predict seizures before they happen in patients who, like, let's say, may have epilepsy. I just ran into a company developed something called the Gut Check, kind of a diagnostic EKG for your gut, which can be helpful for patients who have things like Crohn's and other inflammatory bowel diseases, or tracking patients uh, before and after surgeries to look at the health of the bowel. Really interesting ways we can diagnose things. So how about the heart? Number one disease uh, across the, the world is cardiovascular-related diseases. Uh, we can now measure that in real time. The alive core EKG cases, FDA approved and, and over-the-counter, and can enable you to essentially record an EKG on your smartphone and share that directly with your uh, cardiologist. The app itself can start to record uh, and diagnose is that a atrial fibrillation or another element. And Alive Core is now coming out with a version that lives on your smartwatch. So the way you can acquire an EKG is becoming super easy. And a patient again with atrial fibrillation might be able to use this in a variety of indications. Here's a little video with Dave Albert, the inventor of this technology, Dr. Dave, uh, showing me a version of the new watch face version. Take a look. And so that's all happening today. And so as soon as you finish that, you press save, and now it will process the ECG display it, then use the digital crown to scroll through it, then use force touch to play the audio, and that will bring it up. And now you also go, there I am. I'll be doctor. And there it is. So I can get kind of context. I can say I'm having chest pain, have the EG, and this will eventually go right to the cloud. And, right it the also, and it also takes all your heart rate and activity data since the last recording to really say, did 
I start to slow down, it's my heart rate becoming irregular. So it's really contextualized personal cardiac monitor. Which is going to learn me when I'm normal and that's exactly right. He's going to give you smart alerts to when you need to take your decision. Right. Take my decision, take a nap, take a nap, take a pill, take a pill. So there you go. That's an example of smart, actionable data in context. And these, again, are things you can buy on Amazon.com. Uh, at least the basic uh, smartphone version, not the watch one yet, it's going to really make this um, uh, data contextual and useful, and we can apply algorithms and machine learning to make sense of it. And now we can stream much more than just uh, basic vital signs. You can do a full streaming EKG 24-7 from a wearable patch. This is a, a Bay Area company called Vital Connect, which I'm an advisor to. Um, this can track your full-on EKG, your heart rate, uh, of course, your respiratory rate, your stress levels, your steps, your... Uh, posture, if you fall down, if you call, call 911. Um, that's a lot of data. That's intensive care unit level data coming through your smartwatch. What we're going to need is ways to integrate that and flow that and not make it overwhelming to the clinical side. They have recently partnered with Philips. You use these in the inpatient setting where many patients don't, don't have any monitoring. So I think we'll see these in hospitals. We'll see folks getting sent home from the emergency rooms with them to be useful to be proactive, um, again, in measuring useful information in real time. Let's say you pick up a patient who does have heart disease. Do you want to do the old-fashioned angiogram? Well, now there are ways to do virtual angiograms. This is a spit out from Stanford called HeartFlow. They can do a 30-second scan, send that data to the cloud, and now analyze the patient's coronary blood vessels. Does that patient need a bypass or a stent? What kind of stent? Maybe we'll 3D print the stent to match that patient's anatomy. Uh, really interesting ways now that digital diagnostics is converging at lower costs with much less invasive elements to change heart disease. Or this company called Arteris, also from Stanford, can do a three or four minute cardiac MRI. The data again is analyzed in the cloud, sent back down to the cardiologist or radiologist and can give you really amazing insights into the function of the heart, the valves, everything you get in an echo and much more. So again, digital diagnostics is blending and it's gonna shift precision and personalized medicine. One of the elements uh, that's shifting care is uh, new incentives to bring diagnostics in new forms. I've been involved as an advisor for the XPRIZE for several years, and we designed a medical tricorder XPRIZE, sponsored by Qualcomm, $10 million, to build a true tricorder that can integrate everything from uh, motion to blood levels to temperature and, and beyond. And now, several hundred teams entered the competition. We're entering the final stages right now uh, of the competition. One of them was started just five years ago at my first exponential medicine program company called Scanadu. They're already in clinical trials with this Scanadu Scout. You hold it to your forehead, I only really have it in my pocket, hold it to your forehead and it pulls down your temperature, your heart rate, your respiratory rate, calculates your blood pressure, uh, is embedding that with artificial intelligence in your smartphone. They've also developed Scanaflow, a smart way of doing a urinalysis from home. You dip the urine in, in with a little stick and the app itself measures the colors and does the urinalysis. So really powerful ways of blending vital sign data, lab data at home, which can again help triage and enable and empower the consumer. They've even uh, developed one for flu, scan of flu. These are all still in, in FDA trials, by the way. Uh, that might enable you to analyze whether a patient has influenza or swine flu or Ebola from uh, the distance of home, uh, which would be helpful for public health as well. What's interesting about Scanadu is they've applied a lot of design thinking. There's a whole need to make smart design elements in here. I, uh, I introduced them to IDEO, a design firm, and we made this little movie a couple years ago about what the near future is going to look like as we start to connect all these dots. Take a look. Oh, take a look here. If I can play the video. There it goes. Technology has given us an unprecedented window into the human body. But on a day-to-day -day basis, we're still in the dark about our own health. We are changing that. What if instead of fearing the worst when you notice something out of the ordinary, you could identify the condition yourself? Getting the right diagnosis would save you worry. This is Rosiola. And an unnecessary doctor's visit. Rest at home, it's okay. Instead of hearing about a viral outbreak on the news, imagine you've got an alert that was tailored to your family's needs. It would also give you advice about what to do next. 
what if you had a way to identify what was wrong right away? A way to get all of the information you need to understand the situation. And in serious cases, you would know when and where to seek help. We're building a way for people to check their bodies as often as they check their email. It's all possible. And it's only the beginning. So that's an example of what's coming together already. And those are in clinical trials, pieces of that. And that's going to really shift, I think, healthcare to be much more continuous and proactive and sort of friction free. So there's a whole slew now of diagnostic lab tests that are coming through the world of microfluidics, for example, like out of Stanford and Steve Quake's lab and others that can enable us to take small amounts of blood and analyze various units, including now micro amounts of DNA. So we're now entering an era of what's often called blood biopsies. Um, this is gonna be very important in my field of oncology, the ability to pick up small amounts of cancer-related DNA in your blood and diagnose before a patient has uh, a large amount of, of tumor burden. And I think that's gonna shift how we do screening for breast cancer, lung cancer, colon cancer, in just in the next few years, it's already starting. And companies like Illumina, funded with Bill Gates and others, have now formed companies, one famous one called Grail, which is going to be um, part of this revolution in diagnostics. In your home, you may have very specific lab tests done, depending on your medical needs, at very low cost. And you may even print some of those lab tests out, printing out a test for Ebola, for example, or uh, Zika virus, as you may need, uh, are all becoming paper-based. and and again, be printed at the point of care. And it's really interesting to see the world of collaboration and crowdsourcing come together to help develop some of these new diagnostics, whether it's for Zika, this is from some of our Singularity University graduates who are in Brazil right now working on new ways to uh, diagnose and treat this uh, really challenging uh, uh, infection. Now, we've talked a lot about already about wearable devices, data, genomics. How do you keep up with all this information, whether you're a patient or a consumer, it's just a lot of information, and we need new tools to make sense of this. And one of these tools and platforms is artificial intelligence, or as I like to call it, intelligence um, augmentation, because AI is gonna play a role, it already is in many elements of our lives, and particularly in healthcare, as platforms like IBM Watson have now gone to medical school, and you can access Watson through your mobile phone in the, in the cloud. We're gonna have very uh, powerful ways to apply this, particularly as the dots are being connected with Watson, Medtronic, Apple, J&J, &J, and others. I think it may be malpractice in 10 years for your doctor not to have used an AI platform when they're doing a diagnostic workup or figuring out what might be the best therapy for you. And hopefully with the layering of AI, we're gonna take a look at, again, lots of data streams and learn when to intervene, hopefully early, rather than too late. Where this comes together even further is often called the field of systems medicine or systems biology. Uh, a field founded by amazing physician Lee Hood, he'll be keynoting in exponential medicine this fall, P4 medicine, uh, which is predictive, preventive, personalized, and participatory. And the idea that we can have integrate all these different OMIC data in other realms uh, to make sense of it and use, make it useful. His company, Aravail, is doing work in this space. Human Longevity Incorporated is now pioneering this space as well, where individuals are having in, huge amounts of data collected from full body MRIs, microbiome data, genome data, digital exhaust data, and they're creating essentially health avatars, integrating this information, which I think will be quite useful in super guiding prevention and wellness and health, but also in guiding diagnostics and personalized therapy. So a lot is happening there. Um, the technology itself does not replace the doctor-patient relationship. That patient-doctor bond and that relationship can hopefully be enhanced and uh, connect it even further through technology in smart ways. We need to get our, our EMRs you know, out of being in front and between the patient and the doctor and, ena enabling and having technology as an enabler, not a disabler in some cases. So just a few examples there. Let's switch in the last 10 minutes or so uh, and close off with the future of therapy and discovery. So this area is moving really interestingly as technologies converge and get smaller, cheaper, and, and uh, less expensive. You can now have an endoscopy done from a pill that you swallow. So the, uh, the pill cam is one example. It has a camera and a Bluetooth. Some can even release drugs. Uh, we're seeing robotics being built uh, with origami robots 
So the ability to think, make things small and use them for diagnostics and treatment are becoming more powerful. Gene therapy, moving into really interesting realms because it's not just getting exponentially less expensive to read DNA, we can start to write DNA in the realm of synthetic biology. And that's blending, of course, now with the ability to modify genes. The world of CRISPR, CRISPR-Cas, uh, is exploding onto the biotechnology scene and being applied soon to the clinic in very powerful ways. What would be one example of that? Well, uh, as a pediatric hematologist, I saw a lot of patients with sickle cell disease. They have a single base pair that's wrong in, one of the, in, in, their, in their bone marrow stem cells, in, in their whole body, but really in the bone marrow stem cells, it's most important. So we can take out bone marrow stem cells using gene therapy, the same finger approach in this case, replace the bad gene with a good one, and then do a bone marrow transplant to those patients, reboot their immune system, and they're essentially cured of sickle cell disease. That's being applied to thalassemias and other genetic disorders. It could be a really big uh, game changer. This is going to be applied to personalized oncology where every tumor gets sequenced and we apply machine learning to pick the right uh, levels of therapy and to even design uh, nanotherapies that are um, using synthetic biology. We're seeing ways in therapy to track whether someone's taking their medications. Uh, poor adherence or compliance uh, leads to the, us to the world now where less than 50% of, of therapies are, are taken appropriately. Less than 50% of prescribed pills, for example. So connected pill bottles, for example, and injectors uh, can be part of that feedback loop. We're seeing Proteus Biomedical pioneer the amazing uh, raisin, uh, an R, essentially an RFID in a, in, in, embedded in your pill that can track uh, when a patient's taken it, in, embed and track their feedback loops, and it's dramatically improved in trials, compliance, and for example, blood pressure control in one of the studies. So really interesting ways to impact therapy, particularly in adherence. We're seeing pills being developed that can inject drugs into your gut, which is the M-pill, being developed at MIT. We're seeing the era of electroceuticals, the idea that we can go well beyond the pacemaker to apply technologies to pace our brains for uh, depression, Parkinson's, tremors. So electroceuticals are gonna go beyond just again the pacemaker. We have electroceuticals that are implanted contraceptives that come with a remote control. So imagine the conversation, honey, who's got the remote? <laughs> or what if someone hacks your remote? or hacks your pacemaker, for example. Really, uh, potentially, uh, uh, there are already very interesting challenges with privacy. Who controls this data? How do we make these things secure? From pacemakers to your genome to your digital exhaust that I don't want to minimize, um, but we need to pay attention to. And we can apply other technologies to help and solve. Things like blockchain are being applied to medical data, clinical trial information, and beyond it can be a big part of the solution. We'll see the prescription prescribing of apps as opposed to just prescribing drugs and devices, a drug for pregnancy, a, a drug for uh, pre-op care. Mayo Clinic has shown that apps can be used uh, to reduce heart failure remission, so a big return on investment there. Um, we're seeing apps that are FDA approved and being reimbursed for managing diabetes. Diabetes is such a wide-ranging disease. So many, uh, such a large percentage of our populations have them. And we're seeing now the feedback loops being built into the glucometers. Uh, the one from Livongo even has a social network built in. It can learn the individual, start to crowdsource and improve care. So the prescribing of apps and connected devices is going to be part of acute and chronic disease management as well as health and wellness. Omada Health, a great example of prescribing behavior change. They're uh, taking folks who are pre-diabetic, about to become expensive and often sick diabetics, identifying them, putting them into social networks, connecting them with uh, scales and, and step counters, and can dramatically turn them around much better to be proactive and prevent someone from becoming diabetic when you identify that they're at risk than before they become diabetic. So we're entering a new era in therapy where you can have a digital checkup from anywhere. It's some very fancy, advanced telepresence systems to ones that you can download on your, on your smartphone and use today. Today you won't usually see your doctor, uh, but you'll see a doctor. Soon with the new incentives aligning, you may see your own uh, physician in real time on demand. So it's an interesting era. Curly is a great example, curly.co, of doing asynchronous care. Uh, you're not gonna have to always see someone by telemedicine in real time, you can ask questions and go back and forth all by texting. We're seeing Apple uh, launch recently CareKit, which is gonna, I think, really revolutionize parts of care. I can send someone home with a tracking, a symptom tracker, or a care card. Again, integrating through the mobile device they're using for everything else in their device, their smartphone, uh, and improving care across the continuum and new ways to collect that data from home. Oxner recently published some pretty amazing work, again, using the Apple Watch and these platforms to 
dramatically improve the ability to manage something like hypertension, high blood pressure being such an important um, and common uh, medical uh, issue. So where are you with this? 2015, you can't list your iPhone as your primary care doctor. I love this cartoon that first saw it from, from Dr. Eric Topol. There's a, a new version of this cartoon, 2016. I can't be your primary care physician if you won't download my iPhone app. So these worlds are starting to blame. In the last few minutes, uh, let's mention robotics. Robotics is playing a role throughout hospitals now in delivering drugs to robotic anesthesiologists. This one was just actually taken off the market because the anesthesiologists were very against it. So again, incentives can be misaligned. Uh, they're delivering things in hospitals, robotic pharmacists. We're seeing wearable robotics. This woman is actually paralyzed from the waist down wearing uh, a Brooklyn Bonics exobonic suit. And parts of that are 3D printed to match her own anatomy. So 3D printing, another element that's coming to healthcare and to therapy. We can 3D print for very low cost prosthetics that are gonna match a child and their personality. If they want Star Wars or Marvel character for the prosthetic limbs. We're seeing in the world of orthopedics, would you rather wear this or have one 3D printed and match your exact arm and much more breathable uh, and, and matches your own anatomy uh, that you can wear to the beach, for example. Or treat people with scoliosis and add elegant designs and make them uh, blend someone's sensibilities. We're seeing orthopedic companies develop devices that can be printed and exactly match someone's knee or hip implant. And the medical devices that go with it uh, are uh, going to sometimes be printed along with them, maybe even the operating room themselves, which is going to be quite disruptive to the whole medical device uh, world as well. Patients are getting into 3D printing. My friend Stephen Keating unfortunately developed a brain tumor, and he helped his surgeons out by 3D printing a version of his own brain tumor. Uh, you can see a picture over there, his actual tumor, the 3D printed version. So these things can help surgeons and patients alike and democratize healthcare. One of our um, one of our companies from Singularity University called Made in Space just flew recently the first and now second 3D printer to the space station. You can imagine if you needed a medical device there, it wasn't there already, pretty difficult to get it there. Imagine printing 3D, 3D printing metal, medical devices where when you need them anywhere on the planet, from the space station to rural Africa. You can even 3D print yourself. And here's a version of, of Mini-Me. Um, lots of things and fun you can do with uh, 3D printing. Uh, including helping folks who might have lost part of their face from cancer. So think about 3D printing, it's coming in interesting, empowering ways. I'm gonna move ahead a little bit. Let's mention regenerative medicine. The stem cell biology world is moving quickly. Uh, this gentleman, Shian Yamanaka, won the Nobel Prize about three years ago for developing induced pluripotent stem cells. So you can send a cheek swab in or some blood now and have your own personalized stem cell line made. And those are just starting to come into clinical trials to treat things like macular degeneration. 3D printing of organs, still a bit far away, but can be done in small scale for clinical trials. Uh, we will start to see organs on a chip, again, replacing maybe early stages of clinical trials. Uh, so it's a very interesting little blending 3D printing uh, uh, beyond. I'm gonna move forward here in the last five minutes and um, skip over a device, an invention I had in the stem cell world called the marrow miner. You can learn about it at Regen Med Systems, a minimally invasive way to harvest bone marrow stem cells, something I invented as a bone marrow transplant fellow. Um, which is being use, uh, useful for, I think, hopefully uh, making regenerative medicine more impactful. Last two points in the last two minutes here um, would be how do we democratize healthcare? How do we take some of these technologies and bring them to the most disadvantaged? The poorest on the planet now often have SMS phones. Soon they're gonna have smartphones and soon companies like Google and Facebook will be connecting them to the, to the World Wide Web. So tremendous opportunities to connect and bring healthcare across the planet and deliver it in interesting ways. This company called Matternet, another company that was born at Singular to you, pioneered the idea of using drones to deliver medical supplies, drugs, and devices. We're seeing other folks look at delivering uh, defibrillators uh, or uh, organs by drone, uh, or maybe even drone ambulances to pick people up from battlefields and beyond and bring them to, to safety. There's now even micro drones that are being developed, which might be useful in everything from surveillance and public health to search and rescue. So really interesting technologies being born in healthcare. Last point will be that of discovery. Uh, we want to improve clinical trials. It still takes 10 years, often uh, billions of dollars per drug. What if you can now download, download a clinical trial from anywhere in the world and donate the data from your clinical trial, from your genome, from your microbiome uh, in powerful ways? Well, that year is here. Research Kit was launched a year or so ago and is already showing it's powerfully useful for 
looking at diseases like Parkinson's. You can download the app, Trap Tremor, uh, Trap Voice, which changes in Parkinson's. There's ones for autism, for asthma, for cardiovascular disease. And I think it's really impactful and really bring clinical trials at lower price points uh, to speed up discovery uh, and do more real world uh, trials, not just in the ivory tower healthcare centers. So in summary, that's gonna bring us to a truly crowdsourced exponential world where just like when you drive with Google Maps or Waze, you're, you're sharing data, but you get information back like this, the traffic and how to reroute around a traffic jam, we'll see some of the same sensibilities come to health and, and biomedicine. And I'm hopeful that we can all, in some case, crowdsource diagnoses as CrowdMed is doing and change the mindset of silo data that doesn't, doesn't cross platforms so that we can all, whether we're, whether we're hospital systems, EMRs, or individuals, not just be organ donors or blood donors, but be data donors as well. And if we do that, we can leverage all sorts of information from our social networks, determining who we should shake hands with or not in smart ways during flu season, uh, to really shift uh, our world uh, forward in, in super impactful ways. So I'm going to close out this talk with one other element, which should be that of design thinking in healthcare. You can have all the best technology in the world, but unless someone wants to use it and the dots connect and it feels sometimes uh, elegant and, and useful, it's a bit of a so what. So I would encourage you as you are thinking about developing innovations in health and medicine to think about design elements. And we can take lessons uh, from other fields uh, and apply them to healthcare. I always like the example of lessons from aviation. Um, I've been a pilot uh, since I was 19 years old. I served for uh, more than 10 years in the Air National Guard as a flight surgeon um, with 15 and 16 squadrons. And there's lessons we can take from the military aviation and regular aviation world and apply to healthcare. Checklist that we do in the cockpit. Checklists, which we apply in the cockpit, are now being applied in the operating room to improve patient safety. We are now in the world of medical simulation, just like pilots train in simulators. We're now seeing uh, simulation for training surgeons and medical students and nurses. We're seeing simulations for all sorts of procedures from big operations to uh, minimally invasive ones. And it's great for training in all sorts of procedures. Just some things you just don't want to practice on, on real people. All right. So uh, air traffic control is another element that we have in the flying world. What if we had an air traffic control for all our patients or for our town or for a country or for you individually as you're trying to fly from one health location to another? Or if you're looking at a particular community, you can have a map of where there might be infectious disease outbreaks or, or other elements that are going to be important for you to know as a consumer, a patient, uh, a, or a clinician. So just to finish up this session with you. I know it was a long one. Um, at the beginning, we talked about the power of exponential technologies. And it's really at the point where they come together, where the real opportunity is for, for insight, innovation, and real change in health for crossing our prevention, to diagnostics, to therapy, to global health. So as you think about the future of medicine, think about the convergence of everything from low-cost genomics, body sensors, robotics, 3D printing, artificial intelligence, all of them coming together to converge. And what I want you to do is to start thinking exponentially, realizing that the puck is here. And the famous hockey player, Wayne Gretzky said, you want to skate to where the puck is going to be, not to where the puck is today or right now. So think exponentially, think convergently. And if you do that all together, our future health can dramatically improve from being one that's very episodic, reactive, and siloed in most of the world today, our sick care world, to a true healthcare world where we're continuous and proactive with our data and we can all be participants in the future of health and medicine around the planet. Even when I went back to visit Mass General Hospital, that old ward where I started as an intern is now the innovation unit. So a change can come everywhere in all shapes and sizes. And it's up to all of us to take exponential steps and realize that the future's already here, it's just not evenly distributed. And it's up to all of us not to predict the future, uh, but to go out there and create it together. So I encourage you to take bold steps, move into the future of health and medicine, if I can ever help any of you, you can reach me online or on Twitter. And I'm hoping some of you can join us this October 8th through 11th at Exponential Medicine, uh, exponentialmedicine.com. You can apply and join us. We have an amazing mix of folks in California, October 8th through 11th. Hope to see you around and uh, go out and create the future. Thanks.